Hi, welcome geographers. Welcome to topic 6.9, urban data. And we are going to be talking about qualitative and quantitative data today. So what are some of the things that we will learn? So we are going to talk about how we collect and examine various types of data and how that data helps provide information on changes in the area that we live in. So some of the data that we look at, we look at quantitative data that we get from the census and from surveys um, that will give us information about changes in a population size, changes in a population composition. Uh, and then we also look at qualitative data. And that we get from field studies and narratives. And these things help provide information about people's attitudes towards urban change. So let's really like deconstruct what quantitative and qualitative data really are. Quantitative is something that can be counted. It can be measured. It can be expressed with numbers. So from there, we get information from the census or from surveys. So for example, how many um, people live in your town or your city? How many women are there? How many men are there? That would be data that can be counted and measured and you can get a, a numerical value. Qualitative data is something that's a little bit different. This is uh, something that's more descriptive. It's more conceptual. We get them from looking at things. We go out and we might do field studies or we might ask questions and get narratives from people. So as I mentioned, um, the quantitative data we get from census and surveys and um, this type of data is looking at changes in your population composition. It could be demographics in terms of um, income, ethnicity, uh, it could be education um, levels, it could be gender ratios, age. And we also look at the size, right? The actual numbers. So who do you think would use this type of data? State and local governments, business owners, hospitals. So how could a state and local government use census data? Well, they've got to have an accurate count of the population in a state and in a local government because we determine our representation in the government based on the census data. So if a place, if a state increases in population, they might get another representative to represent them in the United States Congress. If they lose population, then they could lose representation. So every 10 years, we will um, look at the numbers and we might even redistrict depending on where population has changed. Um, business owners would like to use this data too. Um, if a business owner is looking to open up a restaurant in an area, he's gonna look at that or she is going to look at that uh, population size. Is it feasible to open up a restaurant, a Domino's pizza or a Papa John's pizza or some type of fast food pizza? Um, in that area, maybe that area has a lot of elderly people in it. That might be not the best place for that fast food pizza spot. It might be better if he looks for a younger population that might be more into the fast food quick pizza. And so hospitals will use it for similar methods too. Um, we look at quantitative data, um, about changes in population and size in urban areas. And if you look at these two graphs here, these are basically the same type of information. It's shown a little bit differently, but it shows you how population is increasing in um, urban areas. 
So you can see that there is a movement, especially in the in the graph on the right. You see that in the 1700s, 1790, that we had a lot of people living in rural areas. But over time, most of our population um, is now living in urban areas. So that's some of the information that we can get from uh, the, the quantitative data too. Here you see just a little snippet, um, changes in the population size of a county. And I picked Miami-Dade County because, hey, I'm in the 305, that's where I live. And so here we can see that in just over a span of nine years, um, we went from a population of almost 2.5 million and we increased to over 2.7 million. So that's a pretty large increase over just a 10 year, nine year period of time. So our state and um, local governments would be very interested in seeing changes in the population size of a county. Where are these people coming from? Are they coming from other counties? Are they coming from other states? Are they coming from outside of the country? So let's look at some qualitative data. And qualitative data, this is information that you would get by asking questions or going out in the field and looking around and getting impressions from. So field studies, narratives, these all provide information about individual attitudes towards urban change. You can um, do this through observation, one-to-one -one interviews, little focus groups, things like that. So questions that this interviewer over on the right might be asking that gentleman is, what are your thoughts about the county building a soccer stadium in this area? And I put that question up because Miami very recently, we have a new soccer team. And so it was a very, very, very controversial issue to have a soccer stadium built and um, in some of the neighborhoods, neighborhood people, some of them wanted it, some of them didn't want it. So people were going around asking questions, trying to get opinions of the people living in that area. Um, you might also ask, <clears throat> how would you feel about the city creating designated bike lanes in the downtown area? That might be that might be actually controversial too, if you're taking away a driving lane. And then another question you might ask, what are changes have you noticed in your neighborhood over the past 20 years or the past 10 years? So these are all different types of questions um, that you might ask individuals just to get information about their thoughts on change, urban change. So let's practice. Let's do one question. In the United States and Canada, which area unit best approximate a city neighborhood in size? And I'm going to let you pause really quickly here. Think about what this answer would be. So hopefully you picked up that it was a census track. And a census track is really the smallest unit of the census. This is going to be your neighborhood. It's not going to be an entire county or municipality. It won't be an entire congressional district. And it's not going to be a huge metropolitan area. So your census tract is going to be a unit that really is just about your city neighborhood size. So what should we take away from this? We collect data. We collect quantitative data. Um, we look at changes in population composition, like age, gender, ethnicity. We look at changes in population size. We ask questions to get information about qualitative data. And all of this data helps federal, state, and local governments make very, very important decisions 
about congressional representation, even school lunch programs, funding for highway and planning, um, highway planning and construction, public transit systems, hospitals, fire departments. And those are just a few things that help us with data. So thank you so much for joining today. Hi there, geographers. So welcome to topic 6.11. And we are going to be talking about the challenges of urban sustainability today. We'll look at some of the challenges and the responses. So what are some of the things that we will learn today? Challenges to urban sustainability include a variety of things. Um, we've got to throw in there suburban sprawl, sanitation, climate change, air and water quality, the large ecological footprint of our cities, and the way we use energy. And then how do we respond to those types of challenges? Well, responses are usually regional planning efforts, um, remediation and redevelopment of brownfields, and we'll talk about those, um, establishing urban growth boundaries, and farmland protection policies. So let's look at some of the challenges and some of the ways that we can respond to these challenges. We'll look at some examples. So here you see suburban sprawl, right? It's, it's never ending. The city blocks just don't stop. And you can see that in the background, you have a central business district. And then it's just block after block after block of sprawl. And so sprawl creates endless commutes. I mean, can you imagine living too far away and the time it would take you to commute if you have to go into the CBD. So we have these endless commutes, pollution, increased waste and sanitation concerns. We've got concrete jungles and then a loss of natural habitat. So as you are creating the sprawl, remember that you're taking away natural habitat and we are losing some of our biodiversity. This um, endless commute in an urban area, if you look to the right here, this traffic jam, um, it's not just sitting in a car. It is fossil fuel consumption. It is air pollution because all of those cars sitting on that roadway are creating pollution. So these are some of the challenges that we see with urban sustainability pollution and air quality. I mean, China is famous for its smog. This is an image here of Shanghai, China. And China's urbanization really faces the challenges from the industrialization, from all of its factories, uh, the way they consume fossil fuels, and the way that they burn coal for energy. Here, in Shanghai, I'm sure that we would be wearing masks all day, every day. Um, in other places like New Delhi and India, um, they, they face clean water and sanitation problems. So urban areas across the globe faces this problem. Clean water and sanitation is a challenge for many, many regions. Uh, infrastructure sometimes and other regions is not strong. It's not good. And so waste and garbage is just dumped into rivers, rivers that people depend on for their drinking water, for maybe their cooking and their cleaning. So clean water and sanitation is a true challenge when we're thinking of urban sustainability. Some of the responses that we can do um, this is just an example here, remediation and redevelopment of a brown field. So what is a brown field, you might ask? Um, it's actually a site that has probably been abandoned, and it usually has some level of an environmental contamination. A brown field could be a former landfill. 
It could be a former gas station or dry cleaning site. It could be even an abandoned railroad like you see here. But usually brown fields, um, they, they have some level of contamination. And so redeveloping these contaminated and abandoned sites can be really beneficial to the local communities that surround them. In this image here, if this got uncontaminated, um, this would be a great area maybe to, for mixed use, maybe commercial, uh, residential, it could be some type of a park. So let's look at the next slide and see uh, what we have on the next slide. Here we have the New York City High Line. And so this was actually an abandoned railway that um, it was an elevated railway that had really fallen into neglect and it was in such bad shape. The whole area was in such bad shape that they wanted to tear it down, but they ended up repurposing this abandoned railway into this beautiful urban park. And there are condos and homes built along the park. Um, there is this great walkway that you can see. Um, some of the homes are actually multi-millions of dollars. I think one of them uh, sold not too long ago for $20 million, a nice little apartment on the, on the High Line. So these are just some responses, and this has really helped um, regenerate income, um, economic income for this area of New York City. It's now a really big tourist attraction. Other responses, uh, which these require regional planning, um, but we have farmland protection policies that will help protect agricultural lands from suburban sprawl and development. And so in this image here, you see that there's a suburb right there, right next to some farmland. But if we put in protection policies, we protect our farmland. The other types of things that we can do, which also requires regional planning, is we can implement urban growth boundaries or urban development boundaries. And so this image here is an image of the Everglades and the urban growth boundary or urban development boundary in Miami-Dade, Florida. Uh, it's intended to help protect the Everglades from continued suburban sprawl. Much of Miami-Dade County um, has actually been built on and in the Everglades. So Miami-Dade County government has created an urban development boundary in order to protect the Everglades. And who doesn't wanna help protect wildlife and biodiversity? Who does not want to protect that herd of alligators right there <clears throat> and keep Everglades a national park? So let's practice for a second. Let's look at a question. I'm going to let you pause right here and go ahead and um, read the question, and then we'll look at the answer. And while you're doing that, I'm going to put my glasses on. So I hope that you picked letter B, but let's look at this question. Um, traffic congestion is a common feature of major Southeast Asian cities. Which of the following is a possible solution that a city or government or regional government could implement to alleviate traffic congestion and improve the city's urban sustainability? Did you pick A, the government could enact laws that would prohibit the migration of people from nearby rural areas into the city? I hope you did not pick that. Did you pick B, the government could significantly expand the availability and use of more environmental, environmentally friendly mass transit that uses renewable resources? That sounds like a good answer to me. Um, the other choices were the government could enact laws that would prohibit the development of features such as rooftop gardens and urban agriculture. Mm, no. The government could enact laws to limit growth within the city, including the construction of high-rise office buildings 
No. Now, limit growth, if you're talking about sprawl and going out, but going up, no. The government could enact laws to limit external influence in the form of foreign-owned stores and businesses. That doesn't seem right either. So hopefully you put that the government would expand the availability and use of more environmental friendly mass transit that utilizes renewable resources. Well, what should we take away? So just remember that urban areas face really unique economic, political, cultural, and environmental challenges there are a number of ways that urban areas could try to address these sustainability challenges. Some of these challenges include suburban sprawl, um, sanitation, clean water sanitation, sewage sanitation, climate change, air and water quality, um, the large ecological footprint of cities, and the way we use energy. Urban areas can respond by coordinating regional planning efforts, by remediating and redeveloping brownfields, by setting limits on how far you can develop and establish an urban growth boundary and enact farmland protection policies. So these are all challenges and the responses of urban sustainability. Thank you so much for joining me today. 